Sean Barry and his comrades found themselves in back in 1920 was a very different place. In November 1920, the town war was in full flight. The previous month, the Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney, died on hunger strike in Brixton Prison. He succeeded his friend Thomas McCurtain, again murdered by the RIC earlier in the year. And there's no doubt that this county was a hotbed of Republican activity, and therefore the British increasingly resorted to desperate tactics. Midway through 1920, the auxiliaries were raised and deployed, and they set about terrorising the local population. And Tom Barry himself knew that a response was required to that, and he set out about preparing for this engagement. Most of the volunteers involved, they had little or they had no experience of guerrilla warfare, and they had no formal military training. But by contrast to all of that, the auxiliaries were professionally armed and trained, they were highly paid, they had no regard for discipline, they were habitual looters, and they were heavily armed, many of them veterans of the First World War, and they fostered this myth that they were invincible. But at 2am on Sunday morning, a flying column of 36 IRA volunteers assembled and marched 10 miles throughout the night in the lashing rain to this spot. By 9am, they were all in position and throughout the day, the volunteers, their clothes drenched, lay in wait on the sodden heather. They had no food, they had nothing to do just to wait and think and shiver in the bitter cold. But at 4.30 that evening, as dusk gathered, Two grossly tenders carrying 18 auxiliaries drove into this spot. And in a fierce gun battle, which lasted over 30 minutes and ended in hand to hand fighting, 17 auxiliaries were killed and one mortally wounded. The volunteers suffered three fatalities Pat Deasy, Michael McCarthy, and Jim O'Sullivan. During the days following the ambush, the British forces converged on Kilmichael and they carried out large scale reprisals against the local population. Martial law was proclaimed throughout Munster and a pro proclamation issued by the auxiliaries directing that all males passing through McCroom with their hands in their pockets would be shot on sight. The city of Cork was burned, but the people of this county always remained resolute. And as Tom Barry himself said afterwards, the success of the ambush was down to the support that the IRA received from the women of Cumulaman and, in his words, the poor people of West Cork. It was because of the support from the local community that the IRA were able to overcome enormous adversity at Kilmichael and in other encounters. And I think all of these successes gave the people here, not just in this county, but right across the island, the, the, uh, the belief that independence was possible despite the odds. The three IRA volunteers that were killed laid down their lives for Irish freedom. So today it's important not only that we honour their memory, but we honour it by working for a united Ireland and the realisation of a real republic. 100 years later, we remember their sacrifice, we live by their principles, and we recommit ourselves to building the Ireland which they fought to achieve. That's the very best, the very best tribute that we could pay to the Kilmichael volunteers who changed the course of history. Their selfless example continues to inspire us as we seek to positive, bring about progressive change and positive change for our people and for our country. As I said, our fundamental objective as Irish Republicans remains the same, the pursuit of an independent and united Ireland. But there's no doubt there are major differences in the conditions of our struggle today and where we find ourselves, or when, how things were then and how we find ourselves today. Irish Republicans today have a peaceful and democratic path to bring about Path to bring about reunification through the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, which guarantees the right to self-determination, to reunification through consent of the people of this island. And over the course of the past decade, we have marked the centenary of key events which have shaped modern Irish history, and they've defined our relationship with Britain. That's a relationship that's been characterised by colonialism, rebellion, partition, and political division, and over the past 24 years, by peace and reconciliation. I think to understand the current political situation, one must understand how the North became a separate political entity after the partition in 1920. The Government of Ireland Act and the formation of the Northern State. It drew boundaries that were drawn to give unionism a safe inbuilt majority. They set up a Northern Parliament in 1921. And one of the greatest achievements of our peace agreement in 1998 was actually the repeal of the Government of Ireland Act. Because whenever the British administration left Dublin Castle in August 1922, they didn't go back to London. 
They went to Belfast. They went to Belfast to run Stormont and the new Northern State. And the pillars of that very state were based on a Protestant parliament for Protestant people, a unionist police force, a collusive judiciary and civil service, the Orange Order, <coughs> structural political discrimination in employment, housing, voting and gerrymandered boundaries, the use of Special Powers Act to oppress the nationalist population. There was never any official recognition of Irish national identity. Irish language and history were not taught in schools. And the Irish national flag was illegal, as was Sinn Féin. The Civil Rights Association then came about in 67 to campaign for these basic rights and freedoms. And these rights again were denied by the old Stormont Parliament and the Unionist regime. The state responded by unleashing pogroms against nationalist communities. Police killed unarmed civilians and assisted loyalist mobs in burning down homes and businesses. Internment was introduced in 71 and that involved mass arrests of nationalists and 10 people were killed over the course of three days during a rampage by British paratroopers in Ballamurphy. And then in 1972, Bloody Sunday Massacre occurred in Derry when the British Army shot 26 unarmed civilians and killed 14. You see, this is why it's so important to put everything in the political context. Because our Good Friday Agreement, our peace agreement, was the alternative to political conflict. It guaranteed equality and human rights, party of esteem, and civil uh, rights denied to nationalists for decades. It created new power sharing arrangements and recognised the equally, equally legitimate allegiances of unionists and nationalists within the state. It guarantees self-determination through consent, where the people of Ireland will determine the future constitutional status of the North. You know, prior to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the norm was British Army checkpoints existing on the border between the North and South of our country. British military installations built and reinforced from the 1970s onwards were real symbols of division and conflict. But the invisible border on the island of Ireland now has become the greatest symbol of our peace. The Good Friday Agreement provides that peaceful and democratic pathway to unity. And negotiation and dialogue is now how the North continues to emerge as a post-conflict society to confront the present realities, which include the denial of political unionism to accept that the world is changing. You see, the DUP has weakened the union. The Tory, the Tory, or the Tory and DUP Brexit has been an unprecedented folly, and they have created the biggest constitutional crisis for unionism in a century. But that inbuilt unionist majority that I spoke of is gone forever, and the recent census results show the change in nature of the North in terms of our multiculturalism and our change in society. Back in May, the electorate voted in huge numbers in an historic election, and Sinn Féin topped the poll. To this point, as I stand here today, over six months later, the DUP has refused to accept the results of May's election, using the protocol and Brexit as a pretense to not serve with a nationalist first minister. You see, as you all know, standing here today, the Northern State was not designed for someone like me to become first minister. <laughs>